When I was a kid, I used to stare out the car window and pretend that I was flying. Let's just stare out the window for a while. If you want to fly to London or Manchester these days, you can get a ticket for as little as €25 Euro return if you're lucky. But it wasn't always like that. In fact, behind the relentless drive towards more passengers and cheaper fares, there lies four decades of high politics and a bloodbath among the world's airlines. So what happened with flight prices and who won and lost in the battle for the skies? Ladies and gentlemen, we're now making our approach to Dublin Airport. Please fasten your seat belts and no further smoking until you're inside the terminal building. From its beginnings in the 1930s, commercial air travel was a luxury activity. For decades, the whole industry was surrounded with government rules about which airlines could fly where and what fares they had to charge. If we let one American carrier into Dublin, all the indications now are that it will be this one, Pan Am. Underneath row 20, I'll see you on your right. That's right, thank you. 40 years ago, the US started the process of scrapping those rules in the belief that open skies will be good for passengers. Over the next 10 years, airfares in the US fell by 20%, and the number of passengers almost doubled to 455 million. But Europe remained attached to the old rules, which protected big state-owned airlines like British Airways, Air France, and here, Aer Lingus. In its heart of hearts, Aer Lingus seems resigned to one carrier being let in. This week, the general manager of the company, Michael Dargan, wrote, one Irish airline against one US airline, with equal opportunity to serve US and Irish cities, would be our idea of fair competition. On Europe's second busiest route, Dublin to London, only British Airways and Aer Lingus were allowed to fly, and the Irish and UK governments set a legal minimum fare of around 260 euro for a round trip ticket. For anyone else to offer competition or a cheaper price was literally illegal and punishable by up to two years in prison. As for an Irish airline selling tickets from London to Paris or a French airline flying from Dublin to Rome, well, that was an absolute non-starter. But by the 1980s, change was in the air. Led by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, Britain started pushing the Irish government to agree to competition on the Dublin-London route. And here, an entrepreneur called Tony Ryan began lobbying politicians. By 1986, his tiny new airline, Ryanair, had broken into the market and he was taking on the state, which owned Aer Lingus. Just 12 months ago, Ryanair launched its Dublin to London service. Since then, its success has outstripped even its own expectations. On the Dublin to London route, the effect was dramatic. In just three years, fares fell by two thirds to less than 90 euro, while passenger numbers more than doubled. The airline boasts that its low fares have succeeded in making air travel more accessible to more people than ever before. Deregulation, as it was called, became the buzzword. And within a few years, there were no fewer than 80 new airlines flying between European airports. Many of these new entrants followed the Ryanair model. They operated with much lower costs typically used just one type of plane and sold themselves as a no-frill service, which contrasted with the way state-owned airlines often marketed themselves as an elite service. The new entrants had far fewer staff, paid them less overall and flew into smaller out-of-town airports which had lower landing charges. Since its inception, Ryanair has tried to maintain a position as a non-unionised company. The winners in all this were the millions of ordinary people who couldn't afford to fly before the price revolution. And the losers, at least some of those staff members who entered a sector as overall pay and conditions went through the floor. Over recent decades, most of the old restrictions were gradually lifted. A long list of airlines went bust as they fought to outdo each other in the newly ultra-competitive market. Now, there's about a billion people per year flying between European airports three times more than 25 years ago. And airfares have fallen by about 60%. In the meantime, the way airlines operate and pay their staff has changed utterly. And with it, how we literally see the world.